Think with me for a moment. What would it look like to make your community a better place to live? What would it look like? We're going to see a scope of the Bible this morning, beginning in the Old Testament, moving into the New Testament, of how one of the greatest calls, and sometimes maybe we overthink, and it's really ultimately very simple, of making our community a better place to live. Why? Because we have the words of life. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is good news for all things. It is good news for our salvation, but it's good news for every area and every aspect of our lives. Jesus wants to redeem everything, and that includes our communities. And we get to be a part of that great mission together. So think, what would it look like to make your community a better place to live? As I was thinking about that concept, I've always been fascinated by groups of people who are, are new to an area, and they revitalize that area. Or they're not just new to an area, but maybe they're, they don't belong in that area, and they make that area a better place to live. In 1970, in Lewiston, Maine, it was a street that, streets that were filled with families and couples, and there was big department stores, and these were the glory years the city found on manufacturing of textiles, especially shoes, and uh, so much so that for decades, trains would come down with French Canadians in search of jobs. This town was booming, the place to be. One of the uh, biggest mills, Bates Mills, was there, and it was the state's largest employer for more than two decades. But fast forward 30 years, the mills closed up, employment dried up, streets that were once full became empty, and maybe you can think of cities or towns in this part of the country like that. I ended up in a place called Geneva College, which is outside Pittsburgh, which I saw firsthand a lot of the steel towns that have dried up. And you could see what that looked like. Maybe you can envision a town like that. Let's fast forward again to, to the year 2001. At that point, Somalian refugees were on the move, and a lot of them had moved to Portland, Maine. But they had found in Portland that there wasn't much opportunity for some reason, or that there were so many of them that the opportunities dried up pretty quickly. So about 6,000 Somalian refugees moved to Lewiston, Maine. What'd they do? Well, they began opening up the storefronts that were closed. They began employing, actually, local people. Some Somalians actually took jobs stocking shelves and, and keeping uh, stores open that maybe would have closed due to a lack of finding employment. And some of these stores that they opened were uh, stores that stayed up later because uh, the Somalian work uh, culture and how they wanted to be a blessing to the people, and so they opened up their store hours longer. And so the area began, began to become revitalized and grow again. Right now, the largest non-for-profit in Lewiston, Maine, is run by a Somalian refugee. Also, recently, within the last several years, one of the state's largest K-6 through elementary schools reopened, reopened about 900 students in that K-6 through elementary, made up of native people from Maine and people from Somalia. You see, it's an amazing thing when a group of people who don't belong come in and revitalize and rebuild an area, ultimately making their community a better place to live. And we're going to see this morning the call that we all have as the body of Christ, the church, to be a part of that as well. And so to start this framework, we're going to start in the book of Jeremiah this morning. If you have a Bible, you can throw in me. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 29. You might know Jeremiah chapter 29 for its verse 11, that the Lord gives us plans to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us a hope in the future. And we're not going there this morning. We're going to go to right before that. But we're going to start here in, in verse 1. And so again, if you have a Bible or you have it on a tablet, you can open your tablet. If not, it will be up here on the screen as well for us. This is how it begins. Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. So let's get there to gain some context 
this morning. First off, Jeremiah is writing a letter to the leadership, the leadership of the time. The Jewish people were in Babylon by the will of God. God's judgment on them for their rebellion against them has caused, at least at this point, two times where Babylon has came, invaded Judah and Jerusalem, and have taken captives each time. You can see the years up there on the screen of when this happened and about the time that Jeremiah writes this letter. And so the, the Jewish people are in captivity. They don't belong there. They were taken there. And Jeremiah writes a letter to the leaders that he receives from the Lord about what they're called to do. It says here in verse uh, 4, This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon. From Jerusalem. So Jeremiah is writing a letter and he's telling them, here's what you're called to do. But let's just imagine for a moment that you are taken from your home and led to some foreign land in captivity. Think about that for a moment. How much stuff do you, are you able to scramble to pack with you? How much stuff do you have to leave behind in those moments? What are you able to get in your bag? What are you not able to get in your bag? And then you're there. Imagine being in a foreign land, and not just there, you're not on vacation, right? This isn't a cruise, you're in captivity, taken there by someone else, the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar. You're there against your own will. So let's think about it for a moment. What do you do in captivity? This is where I need your help. Throw out a couple things. What do you think we do in captivity? Pray? Okay, it's a good one. We could pray. Really good one, yeah. What else? Complain? That's right. You know how we do that nowadays. I'm all about that. I'm like, let's be real here. I'm getting on Facebook and I am slamming the way King Nebuchadnezzar leads this nation. So I'm just going to, I'm giving it to him, right? I can't believe these things that King Nebuchadnezzar is making us do, right? We're all complaining. Right? It just turns into the land of complaints. Right? That's a great one. What else do we do in captivity? Plot. Huh? Plot? Plot? Like revenge? Or... Right? Right? Yeah, we've all seen our favorite shows where someone escapes jail or escapes something, right? We're all thinking, how can we get out of here, right? Or we're thinking, how can we, like, slash their tires, right? Let's get back at these people for what they've taken, what they've done to us in captivity, Right? It's a good idea. Love it. What else do we do in captivity? Any other ideas that come to mind? Right? That's a good one. He's a compliant man right here. He's like, I'm going to do whatever I have, whatever they tell me to do, and I'm going to be safe, right? That's a good one. Our personalities are beginning to come out. This guy's like, anybody who steps on my property, they're in for, you're like, they tell me to jump, I just ask how high. Any other ones? What do we do in captivity? What's that? Fear. Fear. Sure, right? We're scared. I can't imagine, especially in those moments where we have, fa- we have young kids, we have, we, have, we have families with us, right? The fear must be overwhelming of what's going to take place. All right, so I think we got this idea. We could probably stay here all day and think about this idea. What would we do in captivity? So we're going to see now, though, what the Lord tells Jeremiah to tell these leaders of what they are to do actually in captivity. He says this in verse 5. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children, then find spouses for them so that you'll have many grandchildren. Multiply and do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. That's pretty powerful right there. This is what he asks of them to do in their captivity. Here is what the Lord is asking of them in their time of captivity. But there's something here that's unique in this text that really helps understand this idea of building homes and planting gardens, having families and not dwindling away, and praying for the city. And it's this idea of, and work for the peace of the city. 
What does that mean? Well, here this word peace in the, in the translation of this word is shalom. And this means wholeness or completeness. And so Jeremiah is saying, leaders, in your captivity, you are to work for the completeness or the wholeness of this city. No more plotting. No more complaining. You're to work for the wholeness or completeness of the city. And here's how you're supposed to do it. You're going to plan to stay, right? How long are we going to be here, right? That'd be the one thing I'm asking. When are we out of here? And the Lord's like, plan to stay. Plant, right? Plant is planting homes, planting crops. Produce and populate. Like, you really want to get back at them? Just have a bunch of kids, right? That's a way to get back at someone. Have a bunch of kids running around. They're going to be sick of us in no time. Now, that isn't the reason why. But the Lord wanted them to flourish in their captivity. How often times do we think about it in that way? The Lord wanted them to flourish in their captivity. And then he says, pursue the peace and pray to the Lord. But this idea of shalom, what does that really mean? So the idea of shalom is a full wholeness or a full completeness. You see, we as people are not just spiritual. We as people are physical as well. We're emotional as well. And those different parts make up. And so when the Lord is asking them to pursue the completeness of their city, he's asking them to pursue physical completeness, emotional completeness, and spiritual completeness. He says, plant gardens and build homes. That's a physical way to flourish in your captivity. That's a, that's a physical way for the prosperity of the city to take place. Emotional, right? that's what we say, have love. Love each other and have families together. This is an emotional thing that he's getting after. And lastly, yes, spiritual aspect was to pray. Pray for the, the city. Pray for its leaders. Pray that, they, that the city would prosper because the welfare of the city was all dependent on them and then therefore them receiving that from the Lord as well. Now let's just imagine again for a moment. This is the way I kind of imagine this. Imagine you go out now and you have this garden and you allow that for the the Babylonians to come and eat of it. Can you imagine that for a moment? And they they get to share their, their cherry tomatoes and the Babylonians are like, wow, this is some of the best tomatoes I've ever eaten in my entire life. Why is that? And you can say, well, we're just doing what the Lord told us to do. Maybe one of the ways was to feed the city and to help out people simply through by offering a tomato to you. And they're like, I've never tasted anything like this. Well, yeah, because the Lord has blessed it and the Lord's hand is in it. But we want to show you him through a simple thing like a tomato. And they would bless people by, the, by the, what they produced. And they'd make their city a better place to live by doing that. Now, we can look at that and say that's, you know, a, a, a direct correlation for us, which I believe that there definitely is, and we're going to get to that. But this was definitely a, a letter that was written right specifically to these uh, individuals at this time. And so we need to pull back and ask ourselves, where else do we find an idea like this in the Scriptures? to help us have a a greater framework for what this might look like in our lives. The other thing I want to share real quick is just call a quick timeout sidestep, right? We love Jeremiah 29, 11, right? To give us plans to prosper us, not to harm us, to give a hope in the future. That's a couple verses away from this. But what if we need to pursue the wholeness of our city to get to the point of having the Lord prosper us? What if we need to do verses 5, 6, and 7 to have verse 11 come to life in our life? But we are going to transition this morning. We're going to transition to the New Testament to see how then, as New Testament believers, we fit into this concept or this idea as well. So we're going to jump, we're going to look at a couple different scriptures that give us a framework for this in some greater ways. The first one's going to be 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. I'll have all of these scriptures up here on the, on the screen, so you don't need to be flying through these if you don't want to. But Peter... Peter tells his people that he's writing to, 
These people are being persecuted by Nero. They were lit on fire for candlelight dinners. They were, had meat wrapped around them, chased down like wild dogs, with wild dogs. And he says this to them in 1 Peter 2.11. He says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. He says in verse 12, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. He says, even if you don't fit in to the place you're at in life, live such good lives. That even though they may accuse you, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. But he tells them, this is one of the big ideas of the book of First Peter, that as believers, we are simply foreigners, sojourners, or exiles who are making their way to the promised land in eternity with Jesus forever. If you're a follower of Christ, we are foreigners to this world. This world is not our home. We are simply passing through to a new heaven and a new earth where we spend eternity with Jesus forever. Let's look at this concept another way. I love this. This is Hebrews chapter 11. This is the great hall of faith. And it says this in verse 8. It says, It was by faith Abraham obeyed when God had called him to leave home to go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner, living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob who had inherited the same promise. Abraham was looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. And it goes on here in verse 13, it says this, All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw off from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on this earth. Right. So what makes us think that we're any different? What makes us think that we belong here, that we fit in as followers of Christ? The writer of Hebrews is telling us that they considered themselves not to be of. Peter is saying, you are sojourners, you are foreigners in a foreign land. Even though this might be the place you grew up or the place you call home now, you are still considered a foreigner. In verse 14, he says, obviously people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. And so if you feel at home in this earth at, right now, like truly at home, what he's saying is, is that you're not possibly looking forward to the, con- the city or the promised land of what's to come. For they longed for a country that they came from. They would have, if they longed for that, they would have come back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be their, called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is the amazing thing, that the, the Jewish people found themselves in captivity. They were taken there not by their choice, but now the New Testament is stirring up this idea in us is that none of us are at home either. None of us. And that there's something greater to come. There's a city yet to come that we're supposed to be looking forward to. Later, a couple chapters on, the writer of Hebrews continues to talk about this idea in a little bit different way. Hebrews 11, verse, sorry, Hebrews 13, starting in verse 11, it says this, talking of Jesus, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then to go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For we... For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for a city that is to come. Let's do this together real quick. You see this other translation here in verse 14. It's a different translation than the one that's above. Let's read this together in the bottom one. Ready? For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Do you believe that this morning? It's often so easy to say, I'm here, I'm home. 
I'm here at home. Or is there something in you that longs deeper for that point? I want to make one more connection to help us understand this concept as we get deeper into it. We're going to turn now to the book of Revelation. Revelation <clears throat> chapter 21. John sees this vision and he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. He says, I see the holy city. This is home. I see my final destination arriving. And in verse 5 it says something. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. Here's the deal. If you still have a pulse this morning, if you're still breathing to some extent, that home has not yet come. So what is it that we do then in captivity? What is it that we do here as foreigners and as exiles waiting for our city to come? What do we do? What is it that we are called to do? And I believe verse 5 gives us that insight. He says, look, I am making everything new. I am making everything new. We are, as a followers of Christ, a peculiar people. We are a people of the now, but the not yet. We are a people of the now. We have to live in the now, making all things new, preparing people for a city to come. That is our role as followers of Christ. Preparing people for a city to come through making all things new. Making all things new. It's an amazing thing we get to do. Again, the gospel is good news for all things. It's good news for our eternal salvation, but it's good news for your relationships. It's good news for your finances. It's good news for our addictions in life. It's good news for our hang-ups and our hurts, our brokenness. It is fantastic news. Jesus is in the business of redeeming and restoring all things. And we get to be a part of that. While we wait here in captivity, preparing people for a city to come. So how do we do that? Well, in our church, we've taken on this idea of pursuing the completeness or the wholeness of our city. Making our city a better place to live while we wait for that city to come. And we've taken on this idea of to build homes, plan to stay, plant gardens, and eat the food they produce. Now, we are not planting gardens, and we are not building homes. But what we have done is we have created a separate non-for-profit organization. It's called Rome Community Job Fairs. And we've helped thousands of people find work in our community since 2015. You know, a lot of times, Rome is kind of one of those places. Back in the 1990s, there was a, a big Air Force base, Griffiths Air Force Base there. And the city was about double the size of what it had been, or what it is now. And the city had been kind of starting to go what we would consider downhill, Recently, it's began to be revitalized. And what are, we, what are the things that we want to have happen when, when areas are revitalized? We want to have new businesses come in. We want to have opportunities for employment and people to find work. And so we would say, as a church, what a better way to have a city change around but through the church? Yes, we know sermons are going to be preached every Sunday. We are going to have good small groups but you know what we're also going to do? We're going to make our community a better place to live. We're going to be the ones helping to lead the forefront in our community changing. Why? Why wouldn't we? We have the greatest thing ever. The gospel. The greatest thing. And so what we've done is we've, we've, we've tagged this idea of hosting transformational job fairs. Three weeks ago we held our, our re most recent one. And we had 43 different uh, companies in our building, which made up about 90 different employers that walked in the door. And we had 130 job seekers walk in the door that day of our church. We have about 20 people uh, who are from our church, and they volunteer that day. 
And we do things that are different than most job fairs. Most job fairs you walk into and you walk to a table and you just, it's very transactional. You just kind of walk and do, it, do your thing. And people walk into our church, they're greeted. And we had 20 people walk into our last job fair that had no resume. They sat down with people in our church and they created a resume, printed it out, and then brought it onto the floor. You know what one of the coolest things is when you get to help someone build a resume? You're basically like saying, hey, Share me your story for the last 30 years. And you get to speak into their life. Some people had opportunities to pray with them. And just an amazing thing that has come about. You know, in Rome, when I go out and I uh, meet with people or I meet new people in town, and I tell them, eventually sometimes I, you know, say, oh, I'm a part of Rome Alliance Church. You know what they don't say? They're not like, you know what? I heard there's some great preaching there. And I'm always like, yeah, you're right. You think it's what they say? Eh. Dude, don't shake your head at me, no. Come on. Jeez. Literally, all the time people stop and say, wait, you're the church that does the job fairs. That's our reputation in town. It's not that we have good kids ministry. It's not that we have good worship. But you're the church that does the job fairs. I could, I could probably speak here for hours Hours upon hours about the way God has connected the dots in individual people's lives, into people's stories, of things that God has done by bringing people to, to either faith in Christ or discipleship groups that have started. Stories upon stories. Let's tell one real quick. At our, this past job fair, we had a, a new girl at church work the registration table. One of the things she saw happen was her next door neighbors came to the job fair. And she had an awesome opportunity to follow up with them. That's, a, that's such a cool way to connect the dots. The second thing was, was these two girls walked in. She started talking to both of them. And the one girl stopped her midway and she said, nope, I'm not here for a job. I got hired at the last one you did. And I brought my friend. What a great way just to offer hope. And yes, again, we want them, we want to have, yes, they're going to lead to spiritual conversations. Not all of them, but some of them do. They really do. But first and foremost, we want to do this. We want to love people physically because that's a great need people have. Let me, let me ask a question real quick. How many of you in here have ever either looked for work or currently work? It's the largest demographic of people out there, Right? So this is a fantastic thing that we get to do. I meet people every single week who are looking for a job or in need of a job, and we can help them in between time as well, help them find work because of the relationships we built. All right, I'm going to pause. I'm going to share some more about this in a minute. I consider myself now a job fair junkie, uh, but I'm going to share a video. You can kind of see a highlight. Uh, The guy's going to pop up, John. He's on staff with us. He's our youth and worship young adults guy, and we're going to see some other part of this uh, job fair through a video. How was your experience at Rome Community Job Fairs today? Well, it has been fantastic because it's, I've been doing something a little bit different. I've actually been in charge of just kind of maintaining the traffic. And it's been pretty cool because uh, behind me, both in the church parking lot, but then also in the Barry's Funeral Home parking lot, we have a, basically a full lot. And so it's just been really cool just to see continually people coming in and seeking out jobs. And so speaking of, speaking of that, let me just take care of my job.
cool has been able to have conversations with people. And I actually had a conversation with them uh, with a fellow named Marco. So what was really cool is that when I was in high school, I had to have a Spanish name for my Spanish class, and his name and that name I chose was Marco. So we had that kind of funny connection. I was actually able to pray for him and um, invite him out to church on Sunday. And so he seems he seems, he wants to come because he's been looking for a church body. So if you want to be praying for Marcos, that would be awesome. It was great. There was a lot of opportunities here, and I'm definitely going to apply to a lot of them. It was very nice. It was really awesome, um, especially the resume help. That was really great that I was able to update my resume, and it helped me a lot with that. And there were so many different employees, employers here, and I'm just really, really thankful for um, for you guys for having it today. It was really, really awesome. I appreciate this you know, so very much. So you can see uh, firsthand some of the things that we're able to do there. I, I love this picture right here. <clears throat> so what we do is we, when we be begin every job fair, we bring all, of the, all the employers uh, into the sanctuary. And I begin by just talking about the lay of the land. And we talk about how the day is different. And one of the things we do is that we, uh, each, employ each employer that shows up, we have people in our church, they take a special lunch order and they make them a special deli sandwich again to take that extra time and effort and we want to encourage them, the, the employers as well. Because we know, in this, especially in this market, in this economy, hiring's hard. It's a hard thing, and, and they're all weary. weary. And so uh, we, right when we begin, I, I say, I said, we start our job fairs differently. What we do is we pray here because two things need to happen. Number one, God is going to bring, we're going to pray that God brings the right people by your uh, table. But two, I said, you're carrying, you're carrying an invisible briefcase that you're walking in the doors with this morning baggage you're holding on to, hurts that you have. And we want to pray that you leave here encouraged and that you feel lighter when you leave here and just pray a blessing over their lives. I've never, I've never once ever had someone say, don't do that. But every time we do that, someone comes up and they'll say, you'll never knew how much I needed that today. It's an opportunity to love and care for people. And so when we, when we originally started doing this, I thought the ministry was going to be more to the job seeker. And I was wrong. It's actually more to the employer because the employers are consistent and we can build relationships with them. And so next, uh, uh, in a couple weeks, uh, Tuesday, November 1st, I started this thing about four years ago. It's called the Employer Think Tank. And so we'll have about 30 recruiters that come out. And uh, we actually host it at Delta Lake Bible Conference Center. And uh, we have someone that leads a facilitated discussion. And they rub shoulders and they talk about what's working, what's not working. And they all leave there saying, like, first off, what we're doing is different. And second off, this is some of the best stuff going around. And they all leave there saying, we're always coming back to your job fair because it's the best job fair out there. It's the best because of uh, what I think we offer in making it transformational. But it's also the best. Why? Because I believe the church can do the best things. And that God has gifted our people to be able to do that. We believe in this so much that within the last couple of years, we've removed all the pews from our sanctuary we put chairs in there that we can have all these more employers in our building. And it, it, it's, the dynamic has changed by simply just moving it up there. The conversations begin just to open wide up. We leave our stage set up like it would for a Sunday morning. And just the conversations begin to flow. Like, right, you tell me you do church and here. All sorts of things that just break down barriers and walls. But you know, for our church, it's just a great way to simply be present in our community. To be present in our community. This is a great way to be present with people in, in their lives and in the lives of so many people. Again, I can go on and share stories of how this is uh, changing. I'm in the process right now of working with other church leaders, of helping their churches run these job fairs. It's just a great way to love people, make their community a better place to live as we wait for the city to come, as we live as foreigners in exiles. I have some things for all of us, and you especially this morning, Maranatha, to consider. The first one is this. If people heard that your church was going to be torn down and Costco was going to be put up, would they be excited in your community? Now, some of you are like, yeah. But again, we're talking tear down the building, tear down the gym, and the Costco's going in. Are people in, in your community, honestly, would that would serve them better the Maranatha. If your do doors closed, would your community care? 
It's a question I challenge myself with often. The church does not just exist to be a little bubble away from the world. That while we live in captivity, we can make our communities amazing places to live. Now, I know you're doing that some. I know I'm talking with, with uh, Jared and how you use the gym for the community. That's a great way to add value to your community right there. That's an amazing thing. But maybe there's something else that the Lord can spark up in you or your body as well to say, yes, they would. I know for a fact that if I never preached another Sunday at Rome Alliance Church, most of the community would not miss a beat. But I guarantee you if we stopped doing job fairs, I'd get more havoc from the community than if I stopped preaching. Because our community is impacted and it cares. And it leads to conversations of the gospel. It leads to conversations of hope and healing and prayer all the time. But it's by meeting them in those common ways, loving them physically, that this can happen. As we wrap up, I have a couple questions for you to consider. The first one is, why are you here? You see, the Israelites had no choice of why they were there. They had no choice. None. But why are you here? Recently in my life, I've met several people who cannot stand the season of life they're in. Can't stand it. I know people who've lost spouses recently. And they're like, I don't get it. And I hate being where I'm at in life right now. You know, often as people, we always, we always want to be somewhere we're not. But why are you here? Think about that for a moment. Here. Here can mean a lot of different things. When I look at my address of where I live at home, I ask myself, why am I here? When you go to your workplaces, why am I here, Lord? When you go to your schools, exact school name, why am I walking those halls, Lord? Why am I here? Sometimes we want to be places in life. And other times we don't want anything to do. But that's where we find ourselves. So this is an amazing message that we get to share. That while you are waiting for whatever it is to come, while we are waiting for that city to come, we invest and make everywhere we go a better place to live. Your neighborhoods, your schools, your workplaces, as a church, Maranatha, loving the local regions around you, making it a better place to live. Which obviously we know the greatest way to live is by following the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what we have to ultimately offer. But also we have these other things. So what is it? The other thing I find to go along with that question and maybe this doesn't apply to all of us, but I want us to see, does it, maybe it applies to some of you. Is God asking you plan to stay? I'm not sure what that means in your life. Maybe you're wrestling with something. Is God asking you to settle down? Be here for a little bit longer. Don't just wait and waste your time, though. Invest, 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 invest. You might say, I can't start something like a job fair. But can you do something for a couple neighbors on your street that make your street a better place to be? Can you make your your workplace a better place to be? Can you do something physical to love them? Can you do something emotional to love them? We all probably can do something spiritual. Do we believe that prayer makes all these places a better place to be. And then we're actually investing in that, right? It's easy. Oh, I prayed, I prayed for a couple minutes in the morning, right? Go about my business, pray for a couple minutes at night. How about walking your street and praying for it? Walking your halls at school and praying as you walk your halls at school. Walking and praying uh, as you walk your neighborhood. Does that make it a better place to live? Sure it does. Because he says here, pray for the peace and prosperity. For its welfare will determine 
your welfare. And so we ask ourselves the ultimate question. What would it make to look, what would it look like to make your community a better place to live? Or ultimately, what would it look like to add value to where you are in life? That if you were snatched away, the people around you would miss, be missing out on something because you're adding such tremendous value, which we know it's rooted in a God who loves people physically, he loves people emotionally, and he loves people spiritually. And we get to partner with him as we go about whatever we're doing by simply adding value to where we go, making people scratch their heads. As I get all the time, people would say, why would a church do a job fair? And I'll say, how much time do you have? I simply begin by saying, we want to love people in tangible ways. We want to love people physically so they can ultimately meet Jesus as well. So what would it look like for you in your own life? But also, what would it look like for you as Maranatha Bible Chapel to continue to make your community a better place to live?